I'm working with the American Honey Producers Association to help them to spread the message and the work they do. So this video is an interview with Darren Koss, the, the former president of the association, uh, just to, to give an overview about the association and what they do to help the beekeepers. If you missed the first video, you can find the video right here. So without further ado, let's jump into the video. You know, the American Honey Producers, 51 years ago, uh, decided that we needed to be led by beekeepers, and uh, and so we changed our, our eligibility and voting practice to where you had to be a honey producer in order to be a member. So um, we kind of separated that because it used to be that honey packers would be able to uh, come in and vote and help guide our association, but we wanted to be beekeepers, uh, representing beekeepers and advocating for beekeepers. So that's really where we, we kind of separated to where we're not a federation. We're just a, a group of really honey producers. Um, other things that the honey producers uh, do that uh, beekeepers in general may not be aware of is, is we lead a national policy advocating for uh, beekeepers and uh, ways to uh, for their betterment. Whether it be uh, trying to uh, get expanded CRP fields and coverages advocate for less chemical use in farm ground, uh, lobbying hard for uh, funding for all of our different research labs and be researched throughout the United States. Uh, we also represent uh, uh, the Honey Integrity Task Force that was formed when I was president. And the Honey Integrity Task Force is trying to get the price of honey up to where our main goal is, is that honey sold as honey must be honey. And we've got all the packers. We've never had a group together working on that, a strong group. It was always HPA doing their thing or ABF doing their thing or Sioux Honey doing their thing. Never before have we ever been able to pull, the, pull all these groups into, into one group um, to represent uh, the betterment of honey. Other things that the honey producers has uh, accomplished, uh, today we did the ribbon cutting for UC Davis for the uh, Anubia Lab here. And uh, that started uh, back in 2012, there was a, the honey producers would go to Washington, D.C. every year. And uh, the year before, we had over 40 meetings with different senators and congressmen in a two and a half day period. So just imagine, you know, that you're over there and you're, you're being led around and you've got 10 to 15 minutes to try to have a bullet point with a different senator or congressman or their aides as to why we're important as an industry. And uh, one thing that had come out in publication is Rabobank had said that as far as livestock's economic most importance to human civilization, number one was cattle, number two is pigs, number three is honeybees, number four is chickens. So we found out that the chicken industry had just got $200 million for a new research lab. So the honey producers took that in and uh, decided that was gonna be our lobbying mission, is to get a new lab here in, in California, because this is where all the bees come to, through for the entire country. And uh, we could be able to track uh, the logistics of uh, best management practices and migration practices, overwintering practices, forage, forage and nutrition, pesticide impacts. All this could be done as a hub using UC Davis as, as, as the epicenter of it. So uh, we lobbied for several years and, uh, and really tried and was able to accomplish uh, getting a new lab for UC Davis. And we're, we're very thankful for the uh, funding that was appropriated. And we're thankful for all, all of our members that contribute money so that we can be able to pay our lobbyists to do that. The other thing that many people may not understand is when the executive board travels, when we go to different uh, events in the country or our spring lobbying effort, we pay for our own motels. We pay for our own traveling out of our own pocket. That doesn't come out of the association's dues. That's something that we do as a, as a gift back to all of you. Uh, during our time of service on the board. The uh, concern right now that's, uh, that, that is going on is over the price of honey. Going back to the Honey Integrity Force Task Force, honey sold as honey must be honey. Uh, the honey producers is starting to now do testing to where we're collecting our own samples and asking our, our members to uh, notify us and send us in samples uh, to where we can get them tested and verified to see that Again, honey sold as honey is going to be honey. The other thing that the honey producers has also done is uh, 
we helped form the Pollinator Stewardship Council. We was uh, really the the group that got that started. We, we that group came to being to where it was shared with the ABF and the HPA is a is a set of collaboration, uh, working together to address pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, herbicides, uh, and their impacts on honeybees. Uh, today, the pollinator stewardship is still uh, advocating for us. The honey producers will still accept donations. It will go to help support the pollinator stewardship. H-2A labor has, uh, has, has been a, quite a challenge for us. Uh, we've, we've had labor issues come up to where, for example, my labor has increased uh, over $3 uh, an hour for my H-2 labor in three years. So we'll be turning that over to our uh, our lobbyist in DC and we'll be writing and talking to different senators and congressmen and try to, trying to get the logic back into that, into the labor to where it's, it's affordable labor. Because I mean, we're competing on a global basis for what we hope is honey being sold in our market. And we're competing against other countries that are paying labor rates that's a fraction of what we have to pay for here. And then that honey is brought into our into our country and sold and put on the shelves, and we have to compete against it. Uh, fair trade, fair labor. That's what we're asking for. And right now with the H-2A program, charging uh, what it does for labor, it's making uh, uh, many industries take shortcuts and just hire illegal labor, which just hurts everybody in the long run. Uh, H-2A labor should be a path for uh, uh, people from other countries that are qualified to come here and be able to work in, in the bee business because it's really hard for you to go down to the local job fair and find somebody that's got three to ten years experience in beekeeping. You don't, you don't find that in the United States. We do find it in our in our foreign labor pool uh, to where we can give them people a, a good job to where they can be able to return back home and and live quite comfortable off the amount of money that we're giving them. We certainly don't need to give them so much money that we can't even compete on an international market for domestic honey sales. Honey dumping is uh, when we establish the cost of, of, of what it costs the U.S. beekeeper to bring honey to market, we estimate that's about $2 a pound right now. So if honey is coming in below $2 a pound, you're based on globalization values of another country and what they have to pay for their labor or if they're even subsidized. So we will have, we've, we've had honey coming in from other countries that may or may not be honey, as low as 65 cents a pound. And so if we've, we're forced to sell our honey below production costs, then it's crippling our industry. The, the problem has gotten beyond just one country. We're seeing uh, uh, it's, it's a global uh, slope right now. It's a global slide where all honey in the world is being compromised for the value of production because what is being sold is not honey. We've got to get testing and verification back to be able to identify what is honey and what is not honey and regulate it and then hold accountable the stores that are selling fake honey and hold accountable the packers that are selling fake honey and hold the beekeepers accountable that are deliberately adulterating the honey and then selling it. We have a problem that is domestic and foreign when it comes to adulteration of honey. We have a law. Uh, we got the certification index description. The CID was done by the Honey Integrity Task Force. Uh, that got where it was completed a few months ago, the fall of 2019. So we have a description in, it, in that it says, it describes what honey is and what honey isn't. Uh, resin tech treated product is not honey. All it is is sticky stuff. It, it is a syrup. It is by USDA's definition, no longer honey. I'd like to encourage all the beekeepers out there in the, in the United States to get to know their national trade organizations and uh, take a good close look at them. Uh, I came to my first uh, bee convention in 2008, and uh, it was a joint convention in Sacramento with us and the American Beekeeping Federation. The American Beekeeping Federation is a, is a great group. They're, they're uh, 
they, they work on things helping out hobbyists and help out education and, and teaching and learning and they do work with collaborative projects with the honey producers. The honey producers, we have members that are hobbyists also, but our, our main center focus is, is with the commercial beekeeping uh, group. Uh, we have a great group of guys also and, uh, and uh, we are really trying to look out for the future of beekeeping and being able to make sure that beekeeping is profitable and enjoyable in the United States. We have a e-blast and you can look up our, our website and it is free. If you want to understand more about us, come to our, come to our website and be put on our e-blast and uh, start reading and learning about why the, we have a need for a national organization and what it's doing for you. How people can help the association is uh, understanding what we're doing, talk with their local congressmen and senators. Uh, we're trying to get access to BLM and Forest Service uh, properties and we're being blocked out from that. Uh, we really need, to, we've reached the carrying capacity for managed beehives in the United States. That needs to be expanded. Uh, wherever we have access in our forest to allow the grazing of sheep and cattle, that's a congressional mandate. We should be able to have the same access for keeping bees. When you have uh, property owners that qualify for green belt because they keep cattle, sheep, or horses on their property, or they allow the grazing on their property, the same access and the same tax benefits should apply to honeybees. When honeybees are brought on there to do their foraging, just like sheep or cattle, uh, they should be considered a tax or a benefit also. In the future, what the uh, American honey producers plan on doing is uh, is we're going to figure out how to protect the honey market. Uh, it is an all hands on deck approach. We will do uh, honey testing. We hold, we'll hold uh, accountable uh, people that are that are selling fraudulent honey. Uh, we are considering an anti dumping suit against the different nations that are deliberately bringing. Uh, honey in here below production costs or the Chinese honey that is circumvented that it's avoiding anti-dumping duties. Uh, we'll continue to have meetings with uh, different senators and congressmen. We'll continue to go back and forth to DC as many times as it takes during the course of the year to represent the interests of beekeeping in the United States. Uh, other projects that uh, we're going to be working on is uh, continuing to guide UC Davis uh, and a uh, uh, what is the most uh, important research at the moment for them to work on. We're going to continue to work with the USDA to try to get their, our annual losses down. Uh, it, right now they're still at 40%. Another program that the HPA got going for the beekeepers is the ELAP, Emergency Livestock Assistance Program. This was an HPA initiative drive that, that uh, we've got done for the beekeepers. So there's beekeepers now, if they have an emergency, uh, they're able to uh, have funds given them to them as long as they can have good records and show that their loss is legitimate. It's, it's kept to be businesses afloat that would have went under. So the ELAP program, we're gonna continue to uh, try to get the rates down on that uh, to where our payout goes back down to 16% instead of 22. So that'll put more money in your pocket.